So we're going to begin with the head and then we'll make our way down through the body. But we'll start at the skull base and to give you orientation, you're laying on the exam table and I'm looking up from your feet. So this is your right ear and this is your left ear. So the first brain tissue that we see is called cerebellum, which is right here. And this looks completely normal. It's normal volume, normal signal, and no mass is seen in here. Then I continue to go up and I see brainstem also looks normal, normal signal, no mass, no suspicious findings. And then as I continue to go up, we see more brain tissue. Here's the right cerebral hemisphere and here's the left cerebral hemisphere. And again, all this brain tissue looks very normal. The first thing that I look for is, is the brain volume normal? And, and in this case, it is. The way that I can assess for that is one, by looking at this central structure called the ventricles where the CSF is made. This is the fluid that bathes your brain and spinal cord. Now, if this got larger, then that would be an indication that the brain tissue centrally is decreasing or we're losing volume there. The other way that I can look is in the periphery and between the grooves of the brain. And if that space enlarges, that's an indication that we're losing volume peripherally. In this case, all this looks very normal, no signs of volume loss. The next thing that I look for is a brain mass. We see no brain mass in here. And then I also look for something called white matter disease. And what I mean by that is we're looking for white spots in the tissue around this region. Now, these are very nonspecific and can be from numerous etiologies. They can include things like old trauma, if you've ever had head trauma, could be from high blood pressure that's uncontrolled, diabetes, chronic migraines, and then the autoimmune diseases such as multiple sclerosis. Here we do not see any white spots, so there's no concern for any kind of white matter disease going on here. The next thing we do is we go and look at the brain from the side. So here's the profile, here's the nose, and here's the back of the head. Now the nice thing about this sequence is that I can look at all the midline structures. So right here, this is called corpus callosum, and this connects the two hemispheres together and also looks normal. And then I get another look at the brainstem connecting down to the cervical spinal cord. This also looks normal. And then I can also see the pituitary gland, which is like the hormone control center. So in this case, we can see pituitary tissue right here. And it has a U-shape in this case because some of the fluid that bathes the brain has actually herniated down into this space and pushing on it. But that's a benign finding and generally of no clinical significance. The other nice thing about this particular view, looking at the brain, is I can see all the dural veins that drain the venous blood from the brain. And what I'm looking for here is any bright signal within those veins, which could indicate some blood clot. So here we see nice homogeneous low signal, so no signs of blood clot. And then we can go over to our diffusion sequence. The nice thing about the diffusion sequence, it acts as a functional sequence for us. So we're looking for firmness or highly cellular things uh, like tumors or acute strokes. And here, what we'd be looking for are any dark spots within the brain tissue here. And we see no dark spots. So no abnormal signal on this sequence. So very much a normal looking brain. So now that we've seen a normal brain, we can look at an abnormal brain with a specific condition when I was referring to white matter disease. So here on this axial image right here, we can see that there's white spots around the ventricles. The ventricles, again, are where the CSF, the fluid that bathes the brain and spinal cord is made. So we can see that they're bordering this posterior part on the left, also the posterior part on the right. And if even if I scroll up, we can see some more peripheral still within the white matter. And again, there's kind of a laundry list of reasons why these can actually occur. But I think in this case, with the appearance and distribution, what we're dealing here is with something called chronic small vessel ischemic change and generally related to either hypertension or diabetes. Now, if I want to find out if these are new or acute, I can go to my diffusion sequence, that functional sequence that tells me if these have just occurred or if they're like months to years old. And that the way I do that is I go and find where those white spots are. And then I look at the diffusion and I see if there's any corresponding black spots on there and I don't see any. So that tells me that these are old, at least months to years old. The other thing that we notice with this brain compared to the last brain is that the ventricles are larger and that the grooves in the periphery between the brain tissue are also larger. So this is an indication that there's very mild generalized volume loss likely age appropriate involutional changes. The next thing we look for are brain aneurysms. 
These can either be congenital, you were born with them, or they're acquired due to either uncontrolled blood pressure, drinking, smoking, anything that hurts the vessel walls. And what happens is the wall becomes weak. So it tends to happen at where the vessels change direction. So here we can see the right internal carotid artery and the left internal carotid artery coming up from the neck and going into the brain. And then they split off and this goes and feeds the left side of the brain. Here's the mirror image on the right going and feeding the right side of the brain. These vessels here feed the central portion of the brain. And then this big vessel back here feeds the posterior part of the brain. And now we can see all the vessel walls are very smooth. And so there's no outpouchings, no signs of aneurysm, and all the vessels look widely open. So this is very normal. So now that we've seen what normal cerebral arteries look like, I'm going to show you what an abnormal look like with an aneurysm. So here on the left side, we see the left internal carotid artery coming up toward the brain, and we see an outpouching arising from the left lateral wall of the left internal carotid artery. So this is a great example right here of how the wall has gotten weak and created a outpouching or a balloon sticking out. Now this probably measures around three millimeters. So overall, if the patient has low risk factors, the risk of five-year rupture is relatively low, less than 1%, and can likely be surveilled safely. So the next thing we look at are your sinuses. So the sinuses are air-filled structures in the forehead and the facial bones. So the first thing we see here is the frontal sinus, and we notice that it's all black, and that's how we want it to look, because air on MRI is black, and we want our sinuses to be air-filled. So when we get sinusitis, what happens is the tissue lining the sinus becomes thickened, which is an indication that there's inflammation going on. And that's usually an indication that there's chronic sinusitis. Now, if I saw fluid layering within the sinus, that would be concerning for acute sinusitis. Generally, it's acute on chronic sinusitis is the picture that we see. But then as I scroll down, we have more sinuses between our eyes called the ethmoid sinuses, behind our eyes called the sphenoid sinuses, and then also within our cheek called the maxillary sinuses. And all these sinuses look well aerated, they're black, and there's no signs of acute or chronic sinusitis here. Then I travel behind the nose into the area called the nasopharynx. Now this area communicates with the middle ear, and here's the eustachian tube on the right, and here's the eustachian tube on the left. And what we're looking for here is abnormal tissue growth either on the left or the right. And now what that would indicate is a possible nasopharyngeal cancer. And now this area is really important for us to look at because on clinical exam, nobody can see this unless they take a camera and go through your mouth or nose and directly visualize. So in our case, our exam is a great opportunity to visualize this. And here we can see that there's no asymmetric soft tissue. So there's no concerning findings for any kind of nasopharyngeal cancer here. I also go further back and I look at air-filled structures within our temporal bones called mastoid sinuses. And sometimes when we have obstructing tissue in the nasopharynx, we can also get fluid buildup in our middle ear and fluid buildup in these sinuses here. But yet, just like the other sinuses we looked at, they're black and filled with air, so these are normal. No concerning findings, no inflammation. Then we travel over to this right image here, and now we're going to look at our salivary glands. They're paired structures on the sides of our face. So the first ones we see are the biggest ones by our ears called the parotid glands. Here's the right parotid gland and here's the left one and both look symmetric and normal. There's no mass in there and no fatty atrophy. And then I keep going down further and here's the tongue and I look under the tongue and we have more glands called the sublingual glands and these also look symmetric and normal, no concerning findings. And then I go right under your jaw and these are called the submandibular glands and these also look symmetric and normal. There's no concerning findings, no duct obstruction. Sometimes people get stones in these, but I don't see any signs of stone. I would see a dilated duct or inflammation surrounding the gland. So this all looks very normal.